Cashflow Diary Podcast, Episode 210. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects and one that you've been trying to avoid, sales. If many of you come to me and I've heard you say, Jay, I don't want to do sales. I just want to do real estate. And I, I had it, I heard it once, you know, nothing happens until there's a sale. And you've got to become so many things when you want to wear that real estate investor hat. You want to wear that business owner hat. There are so many roles that you must play. And I'm willing to submit for your acceptance. And I think today's guest is going to agree that one of the most important roles that you must have down pat is sales. And I, I think you're going to hear why, you're going to understand why, and most importantly, you're probably going to develop a, uh, get some insight on some of the habits that you need to develop in order to become bigger, better, better as an investor, as a business owner. And, and I'm willing to bet that some of these habits are going to help you personally too. Today's guest is none other than Butch Bella. He's the owner of a Dallas-based company, B2 Training and Development, where he works with salespeople and organizations to gain more appointments, win more business, and retain more customers. I like all of those things because that's exactly what your business thrives on. You don't have a business until you have a customer. But interesting thing I like is that at age 35, he and a business partner acquired controlling interest in the company he helped build from a $35 million local business to one of the largest wholesale food distributors in the nation with annual sales at almost a, you ready? Quarter of a billion dollars. That's a lot of zeros. The point is, that's called growth. That's called sales. That's called we have someone who knows how to make it happen and happen at scale. So help me welcome Butch Bella. Butch, you there? I am here, Jay. Thank you so much for that uh, nice introduction. I am glad that you are taking the time to to pour into us, and we hope that we take good enough notes to to capture everything you've got to share. Thanks for being here, sir. Well, thank you so much for having me. So um, many people know the first question I'm going to ask you, and 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 you may not, but that's okay. I promise you know the answer. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes, you know, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, etc. cetera. And, right. and I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton in common. Occasionally, uh, we get dressed up. Sometimes we wear tights and masks, and we do crazy things using our special skill sets to improve the quality of life of our customer. And we also have something else in common with superheroes. Superheroes at one time were just usually normal people. Something happened to them, though. Maybe they got bit by a spider. Who knows? Uh, and then suddenly they decided to use that gift and go out into the world in some way, shape, or form. So that means every superhero has an origin story. Every entrepreneur has an origin story. So what we want to know is before you helped the company grow so much more in revenue, before you were out there developing salespeople and organizations, before you were doing all of those things, before the books, before everything, who is Butch Bella? Wow, great question. Um, you know, I was blessed. I grew up in a very, very small town. I'm the middle child, and my parents, Jay, I was blessed to have a, par a couple of parents who are no longer with us, but they never let me doubt anything. I was, 
I was brought up in a culture where I I could have been the president of the United States if I would have wanted to. And they instilled in me a passion to learn, a passion to uh, take on and do anything that I wanted to do. I had my first job at 12 years old. I sold grit newspapers. Nice. I sold Mason shoes door to door. And as other kids got that comic book and saw those superheroes and looked in the back and, and wanted to order the, the x-ray goggles or, you know, whatever the case may be. I wanted to order uh, the sales tactics and, and, and the grit <laughs> newspaper, and I wanted to sign up because I love the fact that you mean I can buy it for 50 cents and sell it for a dollar and keep the balance? And so at a very early age, I was exposed to the fact that I could do anything that I set my mind to. I was, I was a, a, around a, a family unit and parents that really instilled that in me. But I'll tell you, I think that the real moment where, you know, I kind of put on that cape and, and, and things, if you will, was in 1991. It was during my uh, business career. I had, I, at 17 years old, I graduated high school and I was named Dewittius in my class. Now, I graduated third in my class, hmm. but that was because we went in alphabetical order. And so... <laughs> 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 it, it was a small class, too. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I I was named Dewittius, and I could have cared less about being named uh, most handsome, most athletic, most likely to succeed. I went to school because that's where the audience was. I loved entertaining, making people laugh, being on stage, being the center of attention. And in 1991, I was sitting in Little Rock, Arkansas at the Comedy House on a Sunday night with my wife and another couple, and they had amateur night. And they had, well, I say amateur night, they had open mic night before the show started. And these guys go up and everybody, the other couple of my wife, all look at me and go, you're as funny as those people. And so I went and talked to the guy, found out, hey, you can go up and do five minutes if you want to. And at the time, five minutes seemed like, oh man, you can die and go to heck up there in five minutes. <laughs> and so I wrote five minutes worth of material. The next Sunday night, I hit the stage and it was, I've never done hard drugs, but I had literally, I know what a heroin addict feels like with that first laugh. It was, it was, I was hooked. Yeah. And within literally months, I was headlining clubs. My, the owner of the company at the time knew I was doing it because he said, he, he actually encouraged it because he, he saw it as great public speaking training, which I do nice. use today in speaking. But, you know, the thing about it was I became that superhero you're talking about then because I learned so much about sales and comedy. And it's it's a strange mix, but I learned to read an audience very, very quickly because you think most people go to a comedy club wanting to have a good time. No, they're sitting there with their arms crossed. Half of them are going, OK, big boy, make me laugh. You know, and it's a challenge. And so you have to win them over, and you've got such a short period of time to do it. And so I learned that. I learned voice inflection and 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 how to really make people think that I'm thinking. Now I knew just what I was fixed to say just then, but to 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 stumble over a word or uh, to search for a word, I learned to use my voice as a tool. Nice. Now this is back before computers, Jay. I was handwriting jokes. And it, I learned that every word was so important. And so I learned so much about scripting that I would use later in, in sales training and, and building salespeople. So that was really probably, I was blessed to grow up in a household that told me I could do anything. And then when I had the opportunity to go do something that a lot of people would have shied away from, I jumped up and went on stage. And within, like I said, a few months, I was headlining clubs every weekend. So then what you're saying is we, we all need to go practice our stand-up comedy and we'll get better. It would not hurt you a bit, I promise. <laughs> because here's the thing. You go if you can go up and survive in front of some of the because I, I had I had great clubs, but I also had those places where it was me and three drunks and I had to bring my own chicken wire too, you know, to, <laughs> Yeah. And, and and they had a Mr. Microphone for me to talk into. Nice. You know, so it was it was it was the the full gamut. Nice, nice. Yeah, well, I, I've heard it said that if you could make them laugh or make them cry, you could make them buy. So there, there's probably something to that. I will say you are definitely the first one to I've ever heard that says, go be a stand-up, go do stand-up comedy. It'll help you. But I can I can see how 
that would definitely come in into play. Now, you mentioned that this was before computers. There's something else that you said that some listening might not know what it is. I mean, you, you got to remember, we're still dealing with iPhones and iPads and iOS and computers. Could share with, for those who don't know, uh, what a grit newspaper is. Oh, gosh. Grit newspaper came out, I guess it started in the 30s or 40s, and this was in the 70s. Uh, when I was uh, 10 or 12 years old, I guess I started selling them. Grit newspaper was published nationwide, and it was kind of a rural-type newspaper, and it had rural-type stories in it, and it had uh, cartoons in it, and it was just something that that generally the older people bought. But I would stand outside the local grocery store, rain, sunshine, hot, cold, didn't matter, and sell grit newspapers. And, and if I'm remembering correctly, that was 1977. I would buy them for 50 cents, sold them for a dollar, and I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world that I could make money out there that I didn't have to have somebody telling me, okay, we're only going to pay you X number of dollars an hour. And you have to remember that was a time where I, I'm going to guess the minimum wage was probably a couple of bucks an hour. Well, I sell four newspapers in an hour. I'm making more than a guy making a minimum wage. And so I, I saw that as my opportunity. And I never wanted to, quote unquote, have somebody set my value for me. And I have used that as my my experience and as my career has grown, that when you let someone set your value as far as we're going to pay you this, you are so boxed in because you have no place to grow. And I never wanted a job where they would tell me this is all you're going to be able to make. If that's the case, I would have quit in a heartbeat because I would have gotten bored. Indeed, indeed. And for reference, minimum wage in 1977 was $2.30 US. Well, there you go. So, yeah, you were definitely well ahead of adults as well right. as <laughs> kids uh, at that particular moment in time. And this is where phrases like profits are better than wages tend to come into play. And Jim Rohn Absolutely. said that, and that's very, very true. So, I, and I find it interesting that, uh, you know, this experience, this door-to-door -door experience, I've done door-to-door, -door, you've done door-to-door, -door, I've not done newspapers, but I like it, buying at wholesale, selling at retail, all of those things, and then comedy, that is that is a, that comes <laughs> out of nowhere, to be for sure, but yet, all of these things come together to create you as you are, so I'm curious to know, you know, how those first you know, those first sales positions went uh, as well. Did did that, did this prepare you for, for you know, your entry in into sales, like in the corporate environment in some way? You know, I, it's funny. I, my, my grandmother said when I was a child that I was either going to be a preacher or a politician. And I think I kind of split the difference being a <laughs> professional salesperson. And I just always had that, I always had that bone in me, that, I was very blessed to know from an early age exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, I have three weeks of college under my belt. I literally went to college for three weeks. <laughs> Consecutive I, my, weeks, right? My, yeah, three my sophomore week darn near killed me. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> but I did. I didn't. College didn't do anything for me. I wanted to get out and get to work. Now I'm not saying that everybody shouldn't do it. It's great. I, all three of my children have have done it. My my youngest is is starting her freshman year now, but. It wasn't for me. I wanted to get out and get to work. My senior year of high school, where they had what they called COE, Cooperative Office Education. Mm -hmm. And it was generally office jobs that you could get, get a local company to pay you minimum wage, and you could get out half a day your senior year because you were getting some on-the-job training. I went. I worked at a radio station. I was the the nighttime rock and roll DJ part time, and that was what I did. Is you know on the weekends, I went to them and said, "Hey, can I sell for you during the day?" Literally, they had to get special dispensation from the school because nobody had ever said we want to sell instead of working in an office somewhere. <laughs> they gave me a literally a crap account list that nobody else wanted. In four months, I was the top salesman at the radio station. The other guys hated me. You know, of you know? course, of course. But, but I went out and I said, "This, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it the best I can do it. And it was just the bug bit. And it's all I've ever wanted to do. 
you 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 you've seen the movie Glenn Glary, Glenn Ross. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Worst thing in the world to ever happen to salespeople. I promise you. <laughs> the old ABC. Let me tell you, if there's one lesson I can take, forget that. It's ABP. Always be prospecting because I don't care how good a closer you are or how good a closer you want to be. If you don't have someone sitting across from you to talk to, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? I, 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 and okay, I, I hope that the the real estate investors are, are listening right now because – I often take heat and get some flack for focusing so much in our programs and time that you've got to go out there and consistently generate leads. Yes, I know you want to know the, the, the best, you know, caulking gun to use and how to scrape the floor properly and which toilet and tub and, and the order. I know all of those things are important, but you don't get to do all of those things until you bought the house, raised the capital, sold the house, or all those things come later. So true. And, and it's just, it's just so important. And and people want to get to the they if I anytime I train and talk to salespeople and go speak to an organization, you know what would you like to get better? Oh, we want to be better closers. Well, that's fine, but let me tell you something. If you're great at prospecting, and you are phenomenal at building rapport and listening to your your to your client, you don't have to be a better closer. The close will happen naturally. If you're struggling closing, it's because you haven't done a really good job qualifying and building rapport. Because if you do, by the time you get to the close, they're going to just say, okay, Jay, where do I sign? It, oh, man. Uh, I, I, I knew I was going to love this because this – I. I'm like, yay, they get to hear it from someone other than me because you said the two most important things. You said listening, which by by default, if you're listening, you had to ask some questions uh, at, at the end of the day. And it, it was it's really about that relationship and being consistent uh, throughout that entire process. It becomes part of the natural. It's just natural. It's like, well, we've discussed all your issues and here's the solution. So you might as well get started. Right. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Absolutely. And here's something, and, and I wrote a, a blog post about this here, here just recently. And, you know, we have to be careful because we, we get caught up in hearing the, the, the term, do a needs analysis. I've got to do a needs analysis. Well, guess what? I got news for you. People don't buy what they need. They buy what they want. Right. So you need to spend some time learning their needs and then converting it to a want. And I'll give you a great example I use, again, when I speak. I had triple bypass heart surgery six years ago at 43 years old. Now, I got lucky. I didn't have a, a heart attack. I caught it before it caught me. Wow. But here, here's the thing. If they would have asked me May 18th of 2009, Butch, how would you like triple bypass heart surgery? We've got it on sale. <laughs> We've got a deal on it. I would have said I don't want it. I don't need it, and I can't afford it. Right. And that's the stuff we hear every day. But when they said, okay, Cowboy, you got a 70, 80s, and a 90% blockage, I changed my tune. Right. I'm all in. Yeah, but right. Blank check. What, whatever. Exactly. <laughs> Not only do I want it, I want the best guy I can find doing it. Now, right. the only thing that changed was they converted a need to a want. I needed it probably months before I, I had it. Right. But when they showed me the information available to me that converted it to a want, I was on the table in 18 hours. Exactly. And so it's we have to do that with clients. And, yes, they'll tell us their needs and so forth, but then they won't buy because we haven't discovered how does that relate to a want. So th this is going to be the perfect time. For, for some of these questions, some of these things that I know that I've heard okay. uh, that that I, I, I want to hear you answer these. This is going to be fun for me for sure. So okay. what in your head, uh, from your experience and working with everyone that you've worked with, is anyone a born salesperson? Oh, wow. Great question. Um, no, and I'll tell you, and the, the late, great Zig Ziglar used to say that there is no such thing as a born salesman. He said, I've never seen the newspaper uh, that Mr. and Ms. Smith welcomed a seven-pound, eight-ounce salesman. And so <laughs> the, the, here's the thing. Everybody looks at sales as this magical mystery tour that they haven't been invited on. Guess what? Everything a professional salesperson does is a learned skill. The problem is people think they can just go get a box of business cards and be a salesperson. Oh, wow. No, 
that 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 you you may be so, but you're not a professional salesperson. And they say, well, I can't get any other job. I guess I'll go into sales. Really? I, you know, I can't go Monday morning and put on a white coat and start pulling teeth. I'll go to jail. Ooh. You know, it it, it it takes a degree to be a dentist. Right. And the problem in sales is there's such a low barrier of entry that we anybody can come through the door. And so I've kind of made it my mission to professionalize the profession of sales. And in doing so, taking people and showing them – I don't care what your background is. I don't care what what you've learned in the past. If you will follow these steps, it is a learned skill. Just like you can teach people to invest in real estate. You can teach people to do what what you teach them to do. Sales is the exact same thing. It is people, oh, I don't think I can sell. I'm I'm scared to ask somebody for, for Guess what? The reason you're scared is because you don't know how to respond to what they say. Mm. And again, this is what I learned doing stand-up comedy. When when I had confidence in my material, stage fright disappeared. Yeah, I was I wanted to be on stage. That's where I was most because I knew I was going to kill. <laughs> I had so much confidence in my material, I couldn't wait for showtime. But people get antsy because they're afraid they're going to look silly. They don't know what to say. Somebody's going to ask them a question they don't know the answer to. So everything is a learned skill. Nobody is born a salesman. Are there people that are born with with the right personality? Probably so. But again, I think it's something that anybody that puts their head to can learn. Well, and and you hint on something that I, I want to expound upon a little bit in that you, you said no one, you know, wants to look silly, and and, and that's true. You, you maybe you don't know the answer. I have found that you you can't read your way to sell success. You can't, you know, educate your way to sell success in this terms of just watching, you know, books and tapes and CDs or videos or what have you. That you you actually got to go practice it, and you have to risk the and I because I really believe that two things cannot happen simultaneously. You cannot learn and look good at the same time. I haven't figured out how to do that. So sales is one of those places where you have to actually risk looking silly in order to actually learn it. You, you, your listeners are going to think we planned this, but we're boy, we're we're brothers from another mother because <laughs> I had my first sales manager used to tell me that my best training was going to come B to B. Belly to belly. <laughs> nice. And, and that's when you that's where you learn is you go out. But here's the thing that makes a professional, Jay, is a is is an amateur will go out and they'll blame the prospect, they'll blame the weather, they'll blame the government, they'll blame their employer, they'll blame everybody <laughs> else but themselves, where a pro will come back and sit back in their car, their office, their home, look in the mirror and say, Okay, what did I do wrong? Right. How can I get better? How did how how should I have answered that question? Right. What can I do next time to make that process better, smoother, or so forth? That's the thing that a pro does. And I, oh man, you, you're bringing back. I remember there was one time I was uh, selling yellow page ads. That's right, I did yellow page ads. This is door to door. This is not fun. Uh, this is not glamorous under any circumstances. I, I can remember two very distinct instances. It was really, really funny because you don't want to be seen as a salesperson sometimes because uh, salespeople are often treated horribly, but especially door to door. <laughs> but I was walking a, a strip mall and I, you know, for those of you who have seen me, I, I have dark complexion, African-American, and then I wasn't paying attention. I was just walking the doors and then I walk straight into a tanning salon. And, I, <laughs> and I'm like, there's no reason for me to be here other than to sell you something. It, 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 it's just really <laughs> no reason. And I can also remember another, a completely separate time where I'm just in the parking lot crying. Because I'm just like, oh, God, this is challenging to get it wrong so many times before you go and get it right. Yep. You've heard me say it before, and I'm going to say it again. Fail fast, fail forward, fail frequently. It is absolutely something you must do. And it's not fun, And that, but that's okay. That's okay. And we'll get to more of that in just a second. I just want to make sure and remind everybody, if you want to get a copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy, send a text message to 72,000, 72,000, keyword is book. Again, 72,000, keyword is book. Just send that on over there. 
I'll make sure that it comes to you via email. For those of you outside of the U.S. and you can't text a U.S. number, go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book and you will get a free copy as well. Oh, by the way, if we've said anything that you've liked and listened to on any of these episodes, do us a favor. Head on over to iTunes and give us a star, a rating and a review because we would appreciate that, too. Let's get you back over to Butch, and I'm sure you're going to hear some more information that's going to help you face the challenge of making sales happen. So, But you know, yeah. here's the thing, Jay, if I can interject here. What you were doing was the right thing, though. You you had to get out and do that. One of the things that, that I talk about, my first book is called The Ten Essential Habits of Sales Superstars. And I talk about in that book, I want you to write your goals down. And I know people talk all about written goals. And they. Uh, I have people all the time, are you one of them guys that believes in sticking it on your bathroom mirror? Yeah, I am. <laughs> and I think that most of the people that stick it on their bathroom mirror, their bathroom's probably bigger than our houses. Right. You know, So I really believe in looking at your goals. But here's what I tell salespeople to do. Put your goals on the visor, on the underside of the visor in your driver's seat of your car. So that when you come out of someplace like that and you have been beaten to a pulp, and it happens to all of us, and you feel like crying and you feel like going, what the heck am I doing this for? Flip it down and read your goals. Yep. Look at them right then. That's when you need it. There's only one other time where it will do you more good, and that's when you come out of a biggest sale of your career. Your feet aren't even touching the ground. You didn't even touch the car door. It opened by itself. You were gliding (laughs) on air. When you look at those goals, then let me tell you something. The next prospect you call on doesn't have a prayer. Not at all. Because you are on fire. Suddenly they, they, you've never heard no, no means nothing. And yes is the only answer. And they're going to do it today. There is so many things that are are so very true it's just there's there's no avoiding some of those emotions and, and heartache so let me ask you this why okay. do salespeople get such a bad rap you you know i i think it was you know the 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 image of the huckster the fact that there is a low barrier of entry into sales um people have this aversion to calling themselves a salesman they they come up with every title in the book other than salesman i'm proud to tell people i'm a salesman that's if it weren't for salesmen we'd all be hungry and naked and I, I think that it got a bad rap because of the low barrier of entry and you know you you made a great point earlier that i don't want to gloss over and i, and I don't want to skip around but You said you were trying not to look like a salesman. I I teach people, don't look like a salesman. Don't look like a salesman. Don't go go into an appointment loaded down with eight pounds of, you know, sample cases and everything like that (laughs) because that wall is going to go up. Right. When you walk in, if you're calling on a business establishment or you're calling on an individual – just walk up there. I, I carry a little small spiral bound notebook in my back pocket and a business card. If they want that other information, Jay, go get it out of the car. Right. But there's no sense in creating that hurdle for yourself before you ever have to. Because they never that you could be a customer, you could be a friend, you could be right. somebody that's been referred to them for some other reason. Don't go looking like a salesman and we know what that looks like. It's the guy carrying the case and he's, he's struggling and sweating and you know, his, (laughs) his clothes are disheveled and yeah, just go looking like a normal person because you're just going to have a conversation with these people. You're going to ask a few questions, find out if you can help do help them do what they want to do. If so, Hey, there's some next steps you can take. If not, let's shake hands and part friends. Indeed. Indeed. And while we're on the subject to some tips, uh, I, I will tell all of you, if you ever do anything door to door, one of the best times to do it is when it's raining because oh, yeah. they will never, ever think you're a salesman and they feel sorry for you because you're wet. They'll listen. It's awesome. And, and you know what else? <laughs> there are no customers in that store either. <laughs> oh, exactly. You've got their undivided attention. Nothing else is going on. I'm just telling you guys, there's just so that we, I, I have a feeling you and I can have this conversation a lot. Um, you're what, right. What are some of those you, – you, you said you mentioned the book, but what are some of the um, habits that, you know, I'm going to need to develop that we all need to develop in order to become those, you know, super sales stars? 
Uh, well, I'll tell you what, I, the, I'll give you just the, the Reader's Digest condensed version. The book was about five or six years in the making. I started it. It's something that has been 30 years of, of my stuff I put together. Um, my mentor asked me, he said, you need to write a book. And I put, I, when I got hard, I put it on the shelf. And after my heart surgery, I started it again. And then I finally finished it last year. Habit number one in the book, I think, is one of the most important. And that's make 10 new contacts every week. And it's called the 10 essential uh, habits of sales superstars plugging into the power of 10 because everything centers around the number 10. Now here's what I notice. I said 10 new contacts. Yep. I didn't say prospects yep. because what happens is we ten, have tendency to go looking for prospects and we prejudge and we look through our car window or we look at somebody's home or we look at somebody and say, well, that's not a prospect. Well, look, hey, if you can tell that by looking at them, uh, you you need to be on a uh, uh, stage in Vegas, uh, <laughs> making a whole lot more than you're going to make doing whatever you're doing. You know, don't prejudge people like that. If you're going right. to prejudge them, assume that they're a buyer, but make yes. 10 new contacts. And I'm talking about, here, here's the crazy part. People thought, well, 10, that's a lot. No, you know what? You've seen 10 people today. The person behind you in line at Starbucks this morning right. was a contact you could have made if you would have turned around and said, hey, I'm Butch Bella with B2 Training and Development. I work with salespeople and organizations to help them gain more appointments, win more business, and retain more customers. What do you do? And then listen. You know, we, we're, we're, we're walking around with our heads stuck in our cell phone and mm. we've let social media make us antisocial to where we're afraid to have that initial contact. Now, have I had people that have just looked down their nose at me and just ignored me? Yeah. But guess what? That says more about them than me. Yeah. Indeed. That's I don't take that personally. I feel sorry for them. If that guy's life is in such a way to where he can't have a conversation with somebody in line at the Kroger or the coffee shop, he's got bigger problems than I can help him solve. <laughs> you know? <laughs> this is absolutely true. The, the the art of communication has definitely gone by the wayside in this 140 to 160 character world. And I find it interesting. You're being easy on people if you said that it's only 10 contacts a week. Because I've been telling people five yeses a day keeps poverty away. That, that That's my thing. <laughs> You're exactly right. I make it easy. I try to make it easy on them because here's the thing I have found. And I know some of your listeners will do this. They're going to get all fired up and they're going to go out and make 47 this week and then none the next week. Right. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking right. about developing habits. And he, here we've all heard it takes 21 days to establish a habit. Well, guess what? That's wrong. I quit smoking January 1st of 2009. If I were to have a cigarette right now, I'd have a carton before this interview was over, and then I'd have to lay down and let the nicotine high go away. <laughs> so it's not going to take me 21 days to establish a habit. Right. It takes 21 days to establish a good habit. So if for three weeks you'll make 10 a week, you're going to get into the habit of doing it. But here's the thing. As as uh, Peter Drucker said, you can manage what you can measure. So I want you to keep up with it. I don't yes. want you to get to Thursday and say, do I have two or do I have eight? Right. I want you to know who they are, where you met them, and so forth. Right. Because the other thing I tell people is keep a top 10 list. David Letterman made a million dollars, millions of dollars with a top 10 list. And you can too. And it, let me tell you something. It is the simplest thing in the world, but it is your top 10 hottest prospects that you feel like you could close in the shortest amount of time. And I want them ranked. Number one should be literally your next customer. Right. Because every day, Jay, they need to wake up and look at that list and say, how can I move these relationships forward? That's all I want you to do. Just how can I make number six number five, because what's going to happen is he's going to push number five in the number four position. And now you're going to have to do something with number four to get him into a customer. And it literally is working the old Ferris wheel example with only 10 people at a time, because you can manage 10 relationships at a time. 
you if and if they're on your top ten list, I'm not talking about a wish list. I'm not talking about going <laughs> through the through the phone book and saying, "Boy, I sure wish I could get them," or "I would love to talk to them." This is people that are hot prospects for you. These are people that are on the list that you're real close with. But just when you, when you have that conversation with yourself in the morning in the shower, as you're getting your day started, you're thinking what you're going to do. Ask yourself, how do I move that relationship forward? Wow, I. I I almost feel like I'm talking to myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just that's all I can say. It's just like okay, I'm talking to myself. So what else would I ask myself at this moment? I know um, what is some of the okay because I, I know there's a, a certain number of people right now who no matter how great and how much energy you and I bring to this subject because clearly we both enjoy this subject. We've learned to enjoy this subject. They still feel a little anxiety, a little trepidation. So. What's the absolute worst thing that's like ever happened sales appointment wise, et cetera, that, that you, that they could look forward to? Uh, I'll tell I know exactly. And I've never been asked this question, but I can tell you, I was in Arkansas and I was calling on a group of convenience stores. We were in the wholesale food distribution business. And so we had an appointment with this, this gentleman. I was working with a division sales manager. I was VP of sales at the time. And it was one of those people like the guy in the coffee shop I was talking about. We sit down. He's very standoffish. We try to to warm him up and so forth. And he, one of the questions that you want to know in a situation like that is how many stores they have so you can kind of get an idea of how big an account they are, what they're going to do. Now, I knew the information, but I was trying to let him talk and let him tell me his story a little bit. And I I said something to the effect of, so tell me how many, how many stores are you currently operating? And I'll never forget, Jay, he looked me dead in the eye and said, what's that got to do with anything? (laughs) And I said, well, obviously I have caught you on a bad day and I'm not going to waste any more of your time or any more of mine. And I looked at my salesman, I said, Kelly, his name was Kelly. I said, Kelly, I'll wait for you in the car. And I got up and left. Nice. I walked out and here's why. I don't have to put up with that. I'm more professional than that. Now, the guy literally almost followed me out the door apologizing, right. but I left. I You don't have to put up. There's too many other people to talk to. I'm not going to get down in the mud with somebody like that. Again, this guy had bigger problems than I could solve. And it was one of those things to where if we would have gotten him as a customer – I probably would have wanted to kill myself because (laughs) let me tell you something. There are some people you're better off not selling. You have customers today you should fire because they're taking – here's the way I look at it, and I'm going to get off on a tangent if you don't mind. No, not at all. This is great. You as a business person, as an entrepreneur, as a salesperson, you, you are like a teacher in front of a classroom. You've got your A students, and you know who they are. They're the people that pay their bill all the time. They love you. They send you referrals. They can't say enough great things about you. They're literally the people that are probably keeping the lights on for you. You've got your B customers, and they're, they're the ones that are probably not quite as big, but, boy, they love you. They show up. They support your organization. C's are probably new. They're testing you out. They may give you part of their business. They may just be sticking their toe in the water. And then you've got the D and the F students that sit in the back of the room. They're throwing spitballs. These are the people that you chase for money. These are the people that are always claiming that everything that happens is your fault. They're claiming credits that they don't deserve. You can't do anything to make them happy. They're upsetting every person at your organization that answers the telephone. And guess what? Here's what you should do find your biggest competitor and send them to them <laughs> because here's why you're spending all your time with your d and your f students and your competitors don't want them you don't have time to talk to your a and b students so those are the ones that are at, you're in jeopardizing the the relationship with Fire the ones that are taking all your time because they're sucking out your energy and you go spend it with your A students, send the DNFs to your biggest competitor. So now they're bogged down with them and you can go get their A and B students. Indeed, indeed. And I I want everybody to, uh, you probably missed it, but I want you to to rewind and go catch it. But I'll bring it out for you right now. 
there was something about this 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 horrible situation. First of all, you survived the horrible situation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah I, right? I lived through. No, yeah, no, yeah. no, no blood. No one no, died. Not, not a bit. Not, nothing not. at all. So, so what you whatever you were imagining, it's not that bad. Okay, it's just not that bad. Um, I, I and and I'll share with you one of my interesting experiences okay. too, because it was it was pretty funny. But there was something that he said, and I hope you caught it. He said, I was asking the question. I knew the information anyway, but I wanted to open him up and get him to tell him. I hopefully, hopefully you heard that. Sometimes you're asking questions, not because you're trying to gain information. You're trying to build the relationship on a common ground and you're trying to get that information. Yeah, you may already have the answer, but he didn't tell you, so it doesn't count. And I love the fact that you said that. I love the fact that you were doing that because it, it's so important. On this subject of questions, um, I, would you say, because I think so, but would you say that questions are really the answers? Oh, absolutely. And I think you just hit the nail on the head. You should always ask questions you already know the answer to. And, and, and I'll give you a good example. Let's say that uh, you're going in to uh, someone who, uh, I mean, give me, give me a scenario here, Jay, that, that you would have to, to go call on someone. Well, oftentimes what happens uh, for us is, you know, some people, they're working a distressed housing market. So they know that the house is already in some form of distress foreclosure, especially if you're door knocking. You already know that that house is in foreclosure, but you're knocking on their door and you've got to try to get them to tell you that their house is in foreclosure and you would like to buy it. All right. Here, here. Instead of walking up to someone and say, "I know your house is in foreclosure," because that first thing they're going to do is they're going to put up a wall. Well, how do you know that? Yeah, right. right. What, what you know, what you should do is go up and say, "Look, I was looking at your home. I'm looking to buy a home like this. Tell me about your home. How, yep. how much more? How, how much longer do you owe on it? Is it paid off?" Um, do you have it free and clear? Then they they're going to te- because here's the thing, as Jay just alluded to, words that come out of their mouth carry 10 times more weight than those that come out of yours, even if they are the exact same words. Because when it comes from you, you are telling them. When they come from them, they're hearing it literally through the bones in their head. They're hearing those words. (laughs) They're hearing it because they're having to tell you the story. Now you're not selling them. You're a trusted advisor. You're asking questions. You're pulling out information, but you you're I, I envision a hallway, and all these doors are open on the side of the hallway. As you ask questions, all you're doing is easing those doors closed, and you're leading them down this long hallway. And the ultimate end of that hallway is the two of you working together. And all you're doing by asking good questions is you're just shutting those doors very easily where they can't sneak out and, and you know, take off on you or anything like that. <laughs> but it, 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 it's an art. But here's the, here's the great part. That's where scripting comes in. Write down the questions you want to ask. Yep. Write them down and, and make them planned, not canned. And I, I yep. teach people this all the time. If you sit there and you read it like this, they are going to <laughs> tune you out. And the greatest example, Jay, you laugh. I, I make, I, I literally, when I work with salespeople, I make them go watch the scene from A Few Good Men where Jack Nicholson says, You can't handle the truth. Nice. And we've all seen that scene, and, and, and we can feel those words in our bones. I mean, we're like right there on the stand with him. Now, here's the crazy part, friends. When he got that script, it said, you can't handle the truth. Right. But what he did was he put passion into it. Yep. He put feeling and emotion into those words. And if you're going to really serve someone and solve a problem, you've got to bring that passion, that emotion, and that 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 feeling to your voice and your questions. Indeed. Oh man, I this is one of those times where I I dislike that we we th- these episodes go so quickly. Because this, <laughs> we could talk about this for a very, very long time. Now, for those that, you know, have been listening and have got that you get what they're going through, and more importantly, would like to engage with you further, what's going to be the best way for, for them to track you down? 
You can find me at butchbella.com, B-U-T-C-H-B-E-L-L-A-H.com. Uh, there's a place you can click there for a free 50-minute, five zero, almost an hour consultation. We'll talk over the phone, find out if I can help you. But for your listeners, if they will go to butchbella.com slash cashflowdiary, singular, they can download a free copy of the 10 Essential Habits of Sales Superstars. And it's a PDF copy they can download there. And I've got my next book, which is Sales Management for Dummies. I got signed by Wiley and Sons. It will be out in October. And they can uh, find out about all that good stuff at my website. I'm also on Twitter, at Sales Power Tips. And if you're on Facebook, you can find my page, b 2 Training and development. Just spell out training and development, the B and then the number two. Excellent. Excellent. So as we wind down here, I'm gonna I'm gonna do two things. One, I'm gonna share with you what I, I would consider my one of those weird sales moments for myself. Okay. And then I'm gonna ask right. you one question. Uh I, I was actually doing a presentation uh, and the, so it was, you know, it, the location was a little bit different. It was actually a mosque, right? And it was in the okay. afternoon. Um, and I'm in the middle of the presentation. And again, I, I don't practice, you know, that particular religion and I didn't know what was really happening. But in the middle of, so two things happen. The guy who introduces me, it, I, which was, it was awesome. He introduces me and he, he, he says, hi. This guy, he does real estate, uh, and real estate involves debt. We don't believe in debt, but here he is. That's how it started. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, here we go. And then in the middle of the presentation, chanting and music starts going, and everybody, the entire audience, gets up and leaves because they went oh, to go pray. Wow. And then they all come back. Now, mind you, in the moment when they get up, I don't know what's going on. And I'm just like, <laughs> this this is just the the highest, weirdest. If if that you say, see guys, see, that's not gonna happen to you. <laughs> You're you not know, that's not gonna happen to you. All the things that we fear is is th- those things are not gonna come true. If if you will go out and it, here here's the thing, your story, my story, we're laughing about them. Yes, it's not it's not war wounds that we're showing everybody. Oh yeah, here's where they got right. me. At. You know, it's we're laughing about them. Right. You, you, and let me tell you something: as you build your career and you sit around with your buddies when you when you've you've reached this level of success you're looking for, you're gonna want a war story to tell. So get out there and make one. You know, <laughs> <laughs> totally, 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 totally. So. Now, for, for those individuals, those you know, younger entrepreneurs, those ones looking to grow, maybe looking to double, but you know, let's pretend for a second that they're standing in front of the superhero outfit store. They're about to pick out their capes and tights, and they think they want to have a mask, but they're not quite sure because they still have that voice, and you know the voice I'm talking about, in the back of their head. They got that voice going, telling them all kinds of things right now. What would you say to them if they were in front of you? Never stop learning. And he, here, here's, here's what I will tell you is uh, Jay said before, you cannot get everything you need to get out of books. Never stop learning and growing. Never stop experiencing new experiences. Um, and and I'll, I'll hark back to my heart surgery. Uh, when I had my heart surgery, my surgeon was 62 years old the day he operated on me. Wow. Now, do you think that I hoped he had stopped learning when he got out of college? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there was something new in the world of heart surgery uh, that afternoon, I wanted him Googling it on the way home. I, I, you know, hey, I'm in the next morning. Right. So never let yourself get complacent. If you're going to be a superhero, make it learning man. Make it learning woman. Nice. Make it someone who is always soaking up great podcasts like this um you know zig ziglar who is a hero of mine used to call it automobile university you can get the equivalent of a college education just on your commute by listening to good information with audible these days listening to books but don't ever shy away from an opportunity to get out and just go buy coffee for someone that you want to talk to that you want to meet that you'd love to just visit with and you're not looking for anything. Just tell them, hey, I just want to visit with you. And very successful people love to help other people. Indeed, indeed. 
I, I just want to say I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule uh, and, uh, you know, off the comedy circuit to to share with us <laughs> your information here. Oh, I've been done with that for years. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say I, I thank you for taking the time to, to share your unique experiences and invest with us here at the Cashflow Diary. Jay, it has been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Best of luck to you and all your listeners. And it has truly been my pleasure to be on with you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? That probably means you should get over to his site, grab grab a copy of the 10 Habits book, because you know what? You know you got some bad habits, and some of you, you got no habits. Best time to ever start some good habits is with your blank slate. You're a blank slate right now. Go get all the good ones. Make those things happen. I'm telling you, the top 10 list, these are things that that I've done for years. Uh, and it was just awesome to have a kindred spirit today. Hopefully, you heard that. You got that. Let's go get some more stories. Guys, gals, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>